All right. Thank you everyone for joining our webinar. My name is Cynthia Peralta and I'm the senior director here at MedCrypt. For those of you that don't know about MedCrypt, we provide proactive cybersecurity solutions, services, and tools to medical device manufacturers to improve the security posture of new and deployed devices, both pre and post market. Okay, today I'm going to be uh, covering the encryption, key management, and PKI topics, especially as it relates to medical devices, focusing on cryptography to meet the unique security needs of the medical device use case and also help manufacturers meet evolving regulatory requirements. Agenda topics we're going to cover today. Some of it we're going to talk about just a little bit about the FDA's recent guidance that was just issued. We're going to talk about what is encryption, what is key management, what is PKI. We're going to talk a little bit about that PKI framework uh, that some of you may already know about. We're also going to talk about how to create a strategy for securing your data and requirements and best practices as it relates to key lifecycle management, algorithms and key sizes, secure storage, access control, key rotation, key backup and recovery, key revocation and termination, and audit logs. <clears throat> so how does the FDA's recent guidance on refuse to accept affect medical device manufacturers? Guidance issued by the agency on March 30th explains that the new requirements are part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act signed into law in late 2022, specifically a section titled Ensuring Cybersecurity of Medical Devices, which amended the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the FDNC Act. The requirements apply to cyber devices. This is any device that runs software, has the ability to connect to the internet, and could be vulnerable to cyber threats. The new cybersecurity requirements do not apply to submissions prior to March 29th of this year, and the FDA will not reject applications solely on this requirement until October 1st of this year. As referenced by the refuse to accept policy for cyber devices and related systems under Section 524B of the FDNC Act recently published in April of 2023, any device that runs software, any device that has the ability to connect to the internet, and any device that could be vulnerable to cyber threats. FDA's level of in-depth of asking terminates prior to the level of expertise provided by subject matter expertise. So submissions for new medical devices will need to include things such as the description of a plan for identifying and addressing vulnerabilities and exploits in a reasonable time, details on the processes and procedures for releasing post-market updates and patches that address security issues, regular updates, as well as providing out of band. So what that means is anything that's set outside of the release cycle, over the air patches in the case of critical vulnerabilities. Let's see how this translates to encryption, key management and PKI for medical devices. So first we're gonna start with what is encryption? Encryption is a technique by which data is transformed into secret code and obfuscates the information's true meaning. The science of encrypting and decrypting data is termed cryptography. In computing, however, unencrypted uh, data is also known as plain text, and encrypted data is called ciphertext. It's also a process that changes data from its original format into a new format. To translate it back, you typically need a special encryption key or code in order to do so successfully. Encryption ensures health data in transit, use, and storage. The advantage of using encryption is not seeing the actual data in plain text. Therefore, encryption of data occurs in the background, so it doesn't interfere with the healthcare provider's workflow. In other words, you're not really adding another action onto the provider, but rather you're implementing it behind the scenes. The use of encryption secures data from creation, during use, when it's transferred, or exchange to another system and when it's stored regardless of the database location. Now we're gonna briefly talk about key management. In my opinion, key management is the Achilles heel of an overall robust security implementation. Managing cryptographic keys remains one of the hardest problems in applied cryptography. Without proper key management, an otherwise theoretically secure system is in, re is in reality quite vulnerable. So for example, TLS and IPsec are rendered insecure, technically, without a proper PKI. 
and SSH is vulnerable to man in the middle attacks without trusted public keys. All right, what is PKI? Public key infrastructure is a model generally misconstrued in the security sphere. Many security specialists recognize the conventional uses for PKI, such as authentication, encryption, and signing services. But numerous fall short in their comprehension of how it truly operates and is applied. PKI is a fundamental aspect of securing IOMT, which stands for Internet of Medical Things. As an accepted and well-established standard, PKI is a core component of authentication, data confidentiality, and data and system integrity. Now we're going to talk about PKI framework. I think it's very valuable to kind of bring this up a little bit. We're going to touch on it briefly. A strong PKI framework consists of the following components. We have the Certificate Authority, CA, which is the entity that stores, issues, and signs digital certificates. We have a Registration Authority. This is the entity that verifies the identity of other entities. We have Certificate Policies. These are policies that, create, that are created to govern the operation of the PKI. We have a central directory, which is a secure location where keys are stored and indexed. And then we have a certificate management system, which is a system that automates digital certificate management. PKI essentially is a framework that confines the set of roles, policies, and procedures needed in order to create, manage, distribute, use, store, and revoke digital certificates. Digital certificates are issued by a certificate authority, a CA, who represents a trusted third party. When issued, the certificate is linked with a key pair associated to a user, such as a server, a computer, or even a device. And it has a unique identity that is already verified. Once this identity has been verified, other users can trust the legitimacy of the key holder's identity. It's the main objective there. Now, how do I do that? Uh, now that I have shared the reasons for why it's important, you're probably wondering, well, how do we do that? Or what do we do about it? Well, rest assured, I know it's complicated, but we're here to help. In the next few sections, I'm going to walk you through some items to consider in hopes that it provides some guidance and may provide possibly some clarity. We need to create a strategy for securing data and the medical devices. Understand the rules and regulations, which is that the FDA regulates the manufacturers of medical devices, while OSHA regulates the employers, for example. It is the employer who must ensure that the medical device meets the requirements of subpart S. There are several ISO standards for medical device, uh, devices here, but we're not going to talk about that here. The other thing is encryption tools. You need to determine which encryption tools are best suited for your medical devices and their interconnecting systems, according to the data volume and even the business needs. Also need to consider encryption algorithms. You wanna check if the technologies or algorithms being used by your encryption uh, meets international standards. Key management. You wanna decide on ways to generate, store, and replace keys. You also wanna create strategies to destroy the encryption keys in case of a security breach. We're gonna to touch on that a little bit more later. Auditing data. You wanna determine how you will track irregularities or identify unauthorized access to your encryption keys. Keeping extensive logs for physical and logical access is going to be essential for having a complete audit trail. Another thing to check is the speed of the encryption. You would not want to wait for hours or days, et cetera, to get your data encrypted, especially when you have to send it over the network urgently. You'll also want to consider the hardware resource constraints. Cryptography can provide for very strong protections against many attacks and exploits, but it also requires careful selection from a knowledgeable source to assist as you consider methodologies, processes, and hardware, for example, the selection for the right algorithm, key lifecycle schemes, and correct microcontroller units, and so on. So requirements and best practices. We're going to talk about these a little bit more in depth. So key generation. Private keys must be generated inside the product hardware at birth and not shared or stored outside the product. Key storage. Private or secret keys are stored securely at rest, preferably in a FIPS validated hardware device. Single key, single use. A single key must be used for only one purpose, and that is 
one key for encryption, one for integrity authentication, one for key wrapping, one for random bit generation, or even digital signatures. You do not want to use one key for multiple purposes. Unique keys. Product software encryption keys are either A, unique per device, or B, uniquely wrapped per device. As it pertains to encryption, all critical data not limited to protected health information, PHI, is encrypted and authenticated at rest or in transit during the life cycle of the device. Secure communications channels. All communication of critical data requires an authenticated and encrypted communication channel. Number seven here on no old crypto, deprecated cryptographic algorithms are not utilized in new products. We want to take a look at possibly the latest information as it relates to uh, NIST guidelines and standards that are being published. So I would recommend checking out their website for any additional and most current up-to-date information on that. Upgradable crypto, what that means is capital products include the capability to update <clears throat> the cryptographic implementations in the field and at manufacturing. Root key storage. Certificate authorities' private key pairs that are generated for a product line are never exported for the generation source except via hardware security modules. <clears throat> certificate revocation. All products must have the ability to reprovision certificates in the field, especially when it is pertinent to revoke a certificate, especially due to a key compromise. Two-year certificates. Well, I mean, anywhere between one to two years is uh, acceptable, uh, at least for now. The certificate's validity period must not exceed the limit of two years. Expired certificate notifications, for example, immediately after power on of the device, all products with expired certificates must notify the end user with a message indicating the certificate is out of date. There are some other items in here that I didn't cover, but I can quickly talk about, uh, and that is secure boot, for example, all products use secure boot and code signing processes. Boot images to the CA, for example, boot images must both be encrypted and signed with a trusted certificate authority. We also wanna have devices with expired certificates to essentially stop working potentially. It's a possibility. Uh, it all depends on your environment, and your system, and your requirements, and your, your, your business risk acceptance. But products with expired or revoked certificates should not be able to connect to the platform in the field. All right, key lifecycle management. Each encryption key has a lifecycle. It is created, it has a working lifespan, then it reaches the end of its intended use. Managing the lifecycle of your keys is important in order to protect and access your data. The task of key management is the complete set of operations necessary to create, maintain, protect, and control the use of cryptographic keys. Keys have a life cycle. They're created, live useful lives, and are retired. The typical encryption key life cycle likely includes the following phases, such as key generation, registration, storage, distribution and installation, use, rotation, backup, recovery, revocation, suspension, and ultimately destruction. Defining and enforcing encryption key management policies affects every stage of the key management lifecycle. Each encryption key or group of keys needs to be governed by an individual key usage policy defining with which device, group of devices, or types of application can request it and what operations that device or application can perform. So for example, things like encrypting, decrypting, or even signing. In addition, encryption key management policy may dictate additional requirements for higher levels of authorization in the key management process to release a key after it has been requested or to recover the key in case of loss. Now we're gonna to touch a little bit on these algorithms and key sizes. And I can't cover a whole lot here because we're probably gonna run out of time. However, uh, the choice of algorithms and key sizes are incredibly important. It's absolutely essential to take several factors into consideration when selecting the algorithms and key sizes, which may have a direct or even indirect impact on its use, security needs, performance, interoperability, lifetime, and so on. These are the three basic classes of approved cryptographic primitives. We have unkeyed and keyless, typically known as a hash. We have symmetric key and we have asymmetric key. 
A cryptographic hash function, also called a hash algorithm, a cryptographic algorithm which does not use keys for its basic operation, produces a condensed representation of its input. A cryptographic hash function is a one-way function that is extremely difficult or not practical to invert back to the input. Hash functions are usually used in higher level algorithms, including key, key hashed message authentication codes, algorithms, digital signature algorithms, key derivation functions, and random bit generators. The list goes on and on. We're gonna to touch a little bit on secure storage. You need to safely store your cryptographic keys to ensure that they don't fall into the wrong hands. You wanna never ever have your keys hard-coded in your software. This may seem self-evident, but for those that don't aren't familiar with the processes and the reasons for why, it still occurs a shocking number of times, unfortunately, in the field. The use of a hard-coded cryptographic key greatly increases the risk that vulnerability is also notoriously difficult to fix, requiring a software update patch to remediate, and also secure coding practices dictate that uh, variables containing cryptographic keys should be overwritten after each use. This prevents compromise if that memory location is later accessed by untrusted code. You also wanna limit keys to a single specific purpose. Each key should be used for one application and purpose only, whether that is encryption, authentication, key wrapping, random number generation, or digital signature. Keys should be created with the appropriate key strengths for either intended purposes. Using it for a different purpose may not provide the necessary level of security. Refusing a key also can lead to greater damage in the event the key is compromised. Care especially must be taken with key wrapping keys, also known as key encryption keys, KEKs, KEKs. These are keys used to protect other cryptographic strength uh, keys. And the cryptographic keys, uh, they are uh, wrapping, uh, should never be used for an additional purpose such as encrypting data or communications. We also want to use hardware-backed security when possible, such as hardware security modules, which provide highly effective cryptographic key protection and may be mandated in certain use cases, like securing root keys in PKI. This physical device can perform cryptographic functions, such as encryption, decryption, and key generation. Using an HSM removes the burden of secure key storage from a software's logic and reduces the chance that hackers will get access to data and the keys they need to decrypt it all in one place. Other hardware-backed solutions include TPMs. Uh, they are trusted platform modules. And we also have TEEs, which is trusted execution environments, which provide hardware isolated systems to, provide, to perform cryptographic operations. However, hardware-backed solutions can be prohibitive, both in terms of cost and even physical space. They're also vulnerable to side channel attacks that measure the unintentional signals transmitted by physical devices, such as heat, sound, or time taken to perform an action. You also wanna put robust key management in place, uh, such as key management that involves creating a number of uh, policies to ensure that cryptographic keys are not put in danger through ignorance or carelessness. Effective key management policies focus on key lifecycle. This includes the secure handling of everything from key generation, distribution, and normal use to replacement, expiration, archival, and destruction, as mentioned earlier, key storage and backup. As we discussed earlier as well, cryptographic key protection depends on secure storage, such as hardware-based security devices or using something like, I don't know, white box crypto. Keys stored in offline devices databases should be uh, encrypted using KEX before exporting and storing. Applications must include the ability to securely backup keys as data encrypted with a lost cryptographic key cannot be recovered. Access protections and restrictions. So access to cryptographic keys throughout their life cycle must be tightly controlled with users and level of access able to be identified. Such accountability is critical to both keep cryptographic keys safe and reduce the impact of any compromise that does or may occur. All right, next we're gonna talk about access control. As it pertains to access control, we wanna connect access to user roles. So people shouldn't be able to access your system without proper identification. It's like letting strangers into your house without asking for their ID or who they are. 
you need to assign access roles and credentials to everyone who wants to enter your system. It's on this premise that usernames and passwords exist, but so connecting access to user roles promotes accountability as well. If anything goes wrong, you can trace it back to individual users. Every user must have a single username and password, for example. Otherwise, they might create multiple identities to manipulate the system. That wouldn't be good. We also want to prioritize use cases. You don't want to implement access control just for the sake of it. You should focus on how your access control efforts serve and enhance the security of your system. You want to start by identifying the vulnerabilities within your network. What areas of your network or your environment or system pose a high security risk? So for instance, if you suffered a data breach because a cyber criminal guessed your password correctly, you need to pay greater attention to generating stronger passwords, for example. In this case, consider using passphrases and password generating tools to create passwords that are hard to guess. Those are just some examples. You also want to implement the principle of least privilege. Might be frustrating for some to do so, um, as far as users are concerned. Um, but a user who has unlimited access to your system can cause more damage than a user with limited access. As much as people need to execute certain tasks on your system, you should be wary of how much access they have. To be on the safe side, only grant users access to areas that concern them. Restrict them from exploring areas they have no business with. While this might seem strict, it'll help you check users' activities on your system and limit any damage if their account is compromised. This is called the principle of least privilege, P-O-L-P, for short. If anyone needs to access areas that aren't within their coverage, they should request access from you. Should you choose to grant such a request, keep an eye on their activities to detect any foul play and rescind it as soon as you can. You also want to use numerous security layers. You want to visualize the worst case scenarios in securing your system so you can make provisions for them. This entails taking a proactive approach to cybersecurity instead of a reactive one. What happens if cyber attackers bypass the username and password single authentication you have installed? Creating additional layers of security with tools such as multi-factor authentication strengthens your access control. Someone must then be able to bypass all the stages to successfully break into your system. You also want to review and improve access control regularly. There's a tendency to neglect existing access control systems, especially when you are busy with other activities, but change is constant. The people accessing your system today may not always be in your corner. You need to terminate users' access to your system when they are no longer working with you. If you fail to do this, they may take advantage of the situation and compromise your data. If you need to engage contractors and grant them access to your system to perform their duties, ensure that you remove their access once they complete their job. There's a chance that you might forget to revoke the access to of users that you no longer need. To prevent that from happening, you want to have a policy for reviewing your access control periodically. All right, now we're going to talk about key rotation. Every key should have a designated crypto period with the ability to change the key at on demand. Using the same key over a long duration of time increases the chances that the key may be compromised. A crypto period is a time span during which a specific key is authorized for use by legitimate entities or the keys for a given system will remain in effect. There are several factors to be taken into account to define a crypto period. Some of those things include the strength of the cryptographic mechanism, such as what is the algorithm that is being used, the key length, the block size, and the mode of operation, and so on. Other factors are the embodiment of the mechanisms. For example, is it a FIPS 140 level four implementation or a software implementation on a personal computer? Another factor is the operating environment. Is it a secure limited access facility, open office environment, or publicly accessible terminal, for example? Personnel turnover as well, uh, so of system administrators and CA system personnel, for example. You also want to consider the volume of data flow or the number of transactions. You don't want to impact performance. The security life of the data as well. You also want to have limitations required for algorithm usage, such as the maximum number of invocations to avoid nonce reuse. 
We also want to have the security function as part of the consideration, such as data encryption, digital signatures, key derivation, or even key protection. You also want to consider the rekeying method. So is there a keyboard entry rekeying using a key loading device where humans have no direct access to keys or remote keying within a PKI? The rekeying or key derivation process used, you also want to consider the number of nodes in a network that share a common key, the number of copies of a key and the distribution of those keys, the threat of the information from adversaries, such as their perceived technical capabilities and financial resources to mount an attack, and the threat of the information from new disruptive technologies, such as quantum computers. You want to prevent compromise. As we just mentioned, one of the main reasons to rotate keys is to prevent them from being compromised in the first place. Just like you change the locks on your doors if you lose your house key, rotating keys helps to ensure that old, potentially compromised keys are no longer being used. You also want to reduce recovery time. If a key is compromised, rotating keys can help reduce recovery time and minimize the impact of an attack. By having new keys in place, you can quickly revoke access for the old keys and limit the damage that can be done. You might also want to maintain compliance. Depending on your industry, regulations may dictate how often cryptographic keys need to be changed. You also want to improve security posture. Managing SSH keys can help improve your organization's overall security posture as part of a larger security strategy. Regularly changing your cryptographic keys makes it more difficult for attackers to access sensitive data and systems. Additionally, by using different types of keys for other purposes, such as signing versus encryption, you further complicate an attacker's efforts to make it more difficult for them to mount a successful attack. It also increases confidence. One final reason to rotate keys is that it can help confident with confidence and increase confidence, and both in terms of customer confidence and internal confidence. Customers want to know that their data is secure. Patients want to know that their data is secure. They also want to know that they are safe. One way to demonstrate this is by regularly changing your cryptographic keys according to best practices, like those recommended to regulatory bodies such as NIST, the FDA, uh, et cetera. Internally, increasing key rotation can help build a culture of security where employees understand the importance of data protection and take ownership of their role in keeping data safe. All right, now we're gonna talk about key backup and recovery. It's important that all encrypted data is backed up. If the key storage mechanism is damaged or fails, there's a risk that the data is completely lost. Number one, you wanna implement a backup strategy. A comprehensive backup strategy is an essential part of an organization's data protection plan to withstand, recover, and reduce any impact that might be sustained due to a security event. You should create an extensive backup strategy that defines which data must be backed up, how often data must be backed up, and monitoring or backup uh, of backup and recovery tasks. When you develop a comprehensive strategy for backing up and restoring data, you should first identify interruptions that may occur and their potential business impact. Your objective should be building a recovery strategy that brings your workload back up or avoids downtime within the acceptable recovery time objective and recovery point objective. There are things like RTO, RPO, PITR, which I won't get into here, but essentially it's just your ability to recover quickly. A well-designed backup strategy should include actions that can protect and recover your resources from ransomware with detailed recovery requirements for your application and their data dependencies. In some industries, when developing a backup strategy, you must also consider the regulations for data retention requirements. You should make sure your, data, your backup strategy is designed with the necessary retention requirements for the data classification level and or even the resource type sufficient to meet your regulatory needs. You also wanna incorporate backup in DR and BCP. What that stands for is Disaster Recovery and Business Continuity Plan. Disaster recovery is the process of preparing, responding, and recovering from a disaster. It is an important part of your resiliency strategy and concerns how your workload responds when a disaster strikes. A disaster could be a technical failure, it could be a human action, or a natural event. A business continuity plan, however, outlines how an organization intends to continue normal business operations during an unplanned disruption. 
Your disaster recovery plan should be a subset of your organization's business continuity plans, and you should incorporate your backup procedures in your, in your business continuity plans. You also want to automate backup operations as much as possible. Organizations should configure their backup plans and resource assignments to reflect their data protection policies. Automating and deploying backup policies or organization-wide backup plans allows you to standardize and scale your backup strategy. Number four, you want to implement access control mechanisms. We mentioned this earlier. When thinking about security in, in, on your devices, your strategy should begin with a strong identity foundation to ensure a user has the right permission to access data. Appropriate authentication authorization can mitigate the risk of security events. You also want to encrypt backup data and vault. Organizations increasingly need to improve their data security strategy and may be required to meet data protection regulations as they scale. The correct implementation of encryption methods can provide an additional layer of protection above foundational access control mechanisms, providing a mitigation if your primary access control policies fail. Number six, you wanna safeguard backups using immutable storage. There's several types of immutable storage out there. I won't get into it too much, but essentially uh, you just wanna be able to uh, safeguard those backups. You also wanna implement backup monitoring and alerting. Backup jobs can fail. A failed job such as a backup, restore, or even a copy task may have impact on subsequent steps in a process. When the initial backup job fails, there's a high probability that other succeeding tasks will also fail. In such a scenario, you can best understand the course of events through monitoring and notification. Number eight, you wanna have audit backup configuration. You should <clears throat> continuously and automatically track your backup activity and generate automatic reports to find and investigate backup operations or resources which are not compliant with your business requirements. Number nine, you also want to test data recovery uh, uh, capabilities here. Ideally, any data stored as a backup must be able to be successfully restored when required. Your backup strategy must include testing your backups. A backup strategy is not effective if backed up data cannot be restored. This should be done periodically. And number 10, you wanna incorporate backup in incident response plans. Security incident response plans basically are just great opportunities for you to determine if there is an issue with your current incident response plan as well. You wanna test it, same as the line item number nine, you wanna test it regularly at an interval basis. You wanna start with basic and easy simulation exercises and work towards a full more complex event. Right. Next, we're going to talk about audit logs. You should keep a complete audit trail of any and all events that took place for each cryptographic key, including the creation, the usage, and deletion, including any deviation from the normal use. Questions that come up, such as what happened, what are the relevant error messages, event IDs, for example, etc. What systems are affected? Did the logs collect relevant system names and IP addresses? When did it happen? Are all the critical security systems, such as your intrusion prevention systems, are they synchronized with a centralized time source? And is the time zone set appropriately on all endpoints as well? Who was logged in at the time? Are the events tied back to a unique user ID by chance? Those are all questions you want to ask and have answered as you review how to, how to do audit log mechanisms. Key revocation and termination. When generating the cryptographic keys, you need to make sure you have the ability to revoke, destroy, or take the keys offline. In a scenario where the keys may have been compromised or the data has been breached, you'll be able to delete the associated key, thereby revoke the access of the unauthorized party. Every organization needs to have the ability to revoke, destroy, or take keys offline. In the event that data is compromised, an organization can securely delete the keys associated with the compromised systems or data, and by doing so, ensure unauthorized users will never get the keys required to decrypt sensitive assets. Mm -hmm. 
I get it. Medical device security is hard. Deploying, managing, and maintaining a encryption key management and PKI security solution can be a complicated task. We here provide proactive cybersecurity solutions, services, and tools to medical device manufacturers to improve the security posture of new and deployed devices. MedCrypt also offers an array of easy to implement solutions focusing on cryptography, vulnerability, management and security event monitoring. Our products were designed to meet the unique security needs of the medical device use case and help manufacturers meet evolving regulatory requirements. Our team of medical device experts are laser focused on bringing modern cybersecurity to the next generation of healthcare technology, providing benefits to business decision makers through demonstrable return on the security investment and enabling engineers to achieve results today. I would like to humbly thank you all for your time today, and I look forward to hearing from you. I will now turn it back to Kate. Okay, we'll have some time for a Q&A, um, so you can use the Q&A function. Um, it should show up on the side of your screen, so you can type any questions you have into the chat box, um, and Cynthia can work on answering those. We also do have two polls that we would like you to complete, um, so I'll post those now. Um, one of them is about topics you'd want to hear in future episodes um, about in this series, and then another is about the topic that you found the most useful today. So I'll start those, and then also please use the Q&A function to ask any questions. Thank you. Okay, I see a great question here by Steve Dallas. If you can clarify what you mean by the frequency of the updates, updates of what exactly? Here's a great question here by Marty Hummel. Uh, let's see, it says, I often see trust management of certificates left out of the conversation for designing and implementing a PKI. What advice do you have for medical device manufacturers in this area? Great topic, and, and you're right. Um, I, I wasn't able to cover a whole lot in detail. We do wanna take requests for uh, next episode. We will be uh, having a series of episodes uh, possibly quarterly, if not sooner, uh, whether we do it monthly, it hasn't been determined yet. But this is one of the topics as it relates to root of trust, for example, that trust management of certificates is, is the most essential piece aside from the overall key management, right? So as we enhance capabilities for uh, mechanisms that manage those keys, such as replication, generation, and storage, et cetera, you're establishing that trust. In order to establish that trust, you have what's called an embedded root of trust. That root of trust essentially is uh, thought of as I will only accept and or allow certificates that have this particular route that is signing as part of the hierarchical structure of a certificate chain, for example, uh, into my environment. That's typically how it's handled, and I'm happy to cover that topic in more depth at the next episode if, if that's something you guys are interested in. Great question here by Tom. Uh, it says, what are the first steps when securing a medical device where no security framework features or features have been considered? 
The first step really is just recognizing the need, understanding that if there are medical devices that either need to go, uh, you know, basically it's, it's pre-market, right, hasn't gone to market yet, uh, typically the FDA with its recent guidance especially is really scrutinizing on the cybersecurity requirements. And part of that is identifying what are the needs of, uh, in order for us to meet those requirements or guidelines or expectations that the FDA has. So we need to have clarity on that. And that's creating initially your first is your strategy. Uh, we also need to be able to communicate that effectively to our senior leadership, those that make are the decision makers essentially within the organization because a budget is going to be need, needing to be allocated for such uh, efforts, right? Uh, encryption, key management, PKI implementations are not always, uh, you know, cheap. So, uh, so, so having that in place as well as the resources to be able to enable uh, these uh, medical devices and their engineers that are creating and or the manufacturers that are creating these medical devices to be able to do so successfully is going to require some strategy. And we can talk about that in more depth as well in the next session. I did cover a little bit of that, but it would be great to uh, cover that a little bit more. So Juan Francisco asked a great question as well. What does take keys offline exactly mean? Uh, taking the keys offline is just essentially taking it off the network, not allowing those that have uh, a, uh, whether it's they, they chain up through it. So if you have an issuing CA that needs to be taken offline for any key compromise issues, which is a, a major issue, or just an, an entity certificate, such as a medical device certificate that needs to be taken offline due to key compromise or any other factors prior to expiration. Uh, there are methods for taking the key offline until you investigate. Uh, there is a revocation system that can be built out uh, and is available for use in which uh, you have uh, several options within the uh, certificates, uh, the X509 specifically and the V3 uh, version 3. Uh, X509 certificates that have extensions in which you can actually designate what type of uh, revocation you want to um, uh, append onto this particular um, use case for revocation. One of those includes uh, just being able to um, suspend uh, temporarily until you investigate further. Th that, that's essentially the, the utilization of taking keys offline. Hopefully that answers your question. Another great question, Tom. So in the scenario when the device has no network connectivity, does a security topic apply? Absolutely, there's things you can do offline. Uh, understandably, it's not going to have an online type of uh, connectivity or check, for example, for the certificate chaining processes. However, there are things you can do to protect the intellectual property of the device, as well as uh, cryptographically uh, storing sensitive material on a uh, type of MCU uh, that does typically have uh, constrained resources. However, there are mechanisms such as TPMs and others that provide that security so that if at any point um, that hardware device is um, tampered with, uh, it, it will essentially wipe out or clean the device uh, so that no sensitive information can be extracted from the device. Great question, uh, Marty, as well. Uh, much of the question here is much of what you discussed applies to key management and PKI in general. That's correct. That's this is the first episode. We're keeping it, keeping it kind of broad right now, and we're going to dive a little bit deeper based on the requests, uh, not only from you guys, but also what we feel is going to be important or pertinent for you guys to understand in more depth. Um, but the question here is what specific points would you call out that are more significant for medical devices? So, for example, many devices have constrained storage and processing resources. Absolutely. 
uh, recommended uh, algorithms and key sizes, uh, we do understand that there is going to be utilization of symmetric versus asymmetric for uh, certain use cases, as well as uh, possibly even uh, having uh, certain algorithms such as ECC, elliptic curve cryptography, uh, and others that are less resource constrained. Uh, it really just depends on the device, the use case, and the overall system architecture. Another great question, if I understand it correctly from Ravi, uh, it says, in many cases, medical devices are stored in the PHI information and customers production premises where medical device company may not have purview on what, how to mutually, mutually take the ownership of keys and certificates management in these cases. I agree. And we did have a scenario where this happened. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of this, um, uh, such as if you don't have control over the network is what I'm understanding from your question here. Um, and uh, this is, let's say, this is your medical device. Uh, you are the manufacturer. However, you are utilizing the hospital network in which you do not have control over that. Uh, if that's how I'm understanding your question, um, th this is a this is a, a pretty common situation that we've uh, run into. And uh, there's many things that we can do to help alleviate that. Uh, sometimes it can also be done through. Um, contractual agreements. Uh, a lot of times the hospital networks take extra precaution. However, we do not have control over the management of those keys and certificates. Uh, so there can be methods that can be implemented and we can talk about that a little bit more in the next session. Uh, great question here from um, Jose Luis Diaz. Uh, if the customers are located in countries with specific regulations, they don't accept TPMs or certain algorithms such as China or Russia, how does this affect all the PKI system? Uh, actually, China and Russia and other countries that um, do not allow uh, certain hardware uh, security modules or TPMs as mentioned because of the algorithms that are being utilized in the United States, for example, uh, a lot of times uh, there are local vendors that do provide uh, these hardware security modules as well. Uh, it's just doing some research and identifying who they are and, and getting in touch with them to be able to, to build that out. Uh, very common uh, issue that is not necessarily issue, but it's just a, a constraint that is faced initially. Uh, but once you figure out that there are vendors out there that um, that uh, are utilizing their own proprietary uh, algorithms uh, that are that are not based on ours, um, it makes it makes it a little bit easier to to implement a PKI system. <laughs> Marty, great question. It kind of made me chuckle a little bit here. Um, in your experience, which group of stakeholders are the most challenging to deal with? A medical device manufacturers, B FDA, C clinicians, and D care delivery organizations and E end users. Um, you know, I wouldn't say necessarily the most challenging to deal with, uh, but probably I would say the contract manufacturing facilities. A lot of times, unfortunately, uh, how do I say this? Uh, it could be a little bit of a wild, wild west. Um, uh, they, they do have to abide by certain regulatory standards such as ISO and others. Uh, but what I have seen or witnessed is that uh, these medical device manufacturers have a vested interest in protecting their medical devices, and uh, they're trusting that these manufacturing plants are actually doing things correctly. And when they come to find out, uh, once we do a physical assessment and or logical assessment of, of such environment, uh, we discover a lot of holes and in which there's a possibility or even a risk or there has already been a leak. 
uh, with the outside world, uh, whether it's uh, having connections to the outside, um, whether it's the methods in which they do the injection of those keys, et cetera. So uh, that, that's where I think a majority of the concerns or issues are starting to come about uh, most recently anyways. All right, we have six minutes left. Any other questions? And I see a question here from Babu. Um, uh, how do code signing, how can code signing be utilized for non-internet connected devices when relying solely on certificate chain checking uh, is insufficient? Is there a way to leverage offline checks similar to OCSP? Uh, there are methods. Uh, it, it has to really be dependent upon the overall system architecture and design. However, uh, it does make it extra a little bit difficult. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit more in the next episode. I would love to dig a little bit deeper into these uh, non-connected devices. I, I think that's a great topic for our next episode. If that's something you guys are interested in, feel free to let me know. You can send me an email. I'm happy to answer any questions you have as well. Um, but we definitely will take the recommendations and suggestions for the next episode, and we can talk about those non-connected devices and also the resource-constrained devices, which I think is some, a topic that many, many medical device manufacturers and others within this industry are very interested in hearing more about. Uh, Tom, you had a question about slides. Uh, that will be sent after the uh, the session. We have the slide deck that will be sent along with the recording. I believe Kate has more insight on how that works. Yeah, we will send out the slides to um, everyone who registered and also the recording. And um, it will also be up on YouTube and shared on our social media as well. Thank you, Kate. I don't see any more newer questions. Um, all right, if there's no more questions, uh, we can conclude the session. Then we'll conclude here. Thank you all for joining um, and we'll send out the materials uh, later this week. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Have a great day.